Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Ontario Coaches Conference and today's first session from culture to content and athlete center approach to optimize learning. A few housekeeping items for you before we get started. This session will run until approximately 1.30 p.m. You may use the public session chat on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions that will be read aloud at the end of the presentation. If at any time you need assistance, you can contact the CAO team by using the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen that says contact the CAO and a member of CAO staff will get back to you. Today's session is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 24 hours from the sessions tab. Today, we are excited to bring to you Safu Bernard, Director of Player Development for the 2019 WNBA Champion Washington Mischiefs. He has worked for the past 20 years in the NBA, domestically and internationally, WNBA, NHL, and within an international context with Canada Basketball and FIBA. A graduate of the University of Windsor, Safu is a coach by training and a teacher by calling, an NCCP certified coach, and holds a FIBA IOC certification. Please join me in welcoming Safu Bernard. Over to you, Safu. Thank you, thrilled to be here. Um, I'm excited to present. I hear day one kicked off really well, so this will be my contribution. We will touch on and I'll give some examples of an athlete-centered approach to optimizing learning that will touch in on both the culture and the content that can be used. And so for some, key, for some key takeaways for everybody, the first one of which is my encouragement is to coach the person, then the player. We have to get good at coaching the person in front of us, not who we want them to be. And then also think about the player that they aspire to be and align our coaching style, our tactics, the techniques that we use with where they want to go. What are their dream goals? Second thing is, we're going to dig into ways to design practice, both to promote and optimize learning. And we'll, I'll share some practical and evidence-based techniques for doing that. The third one is, I want to unpack and peel back some layers around culture, language, and routines, things that uh, you can use, hopefully, as takeaways within your own individual context. As shared earlier, I am going to pull from the breadth of experiences that I've had over the years, and I'm going to share some ideas that have been passed along to me from some really sharp minds and in the course of my years in sport, both from grassroots to the highest performance levels, I've been around and been able to go and learn from some talent hotbeds throughout the world. And so many of the examples and the learnings that you'll see baked into the presentation come from not only basketball, um, other disciplines in sport, and also other spaces outside of sport. I love this picture. It's a great reminder to me, and I think to anyone, that one angle is not enough. And beyond that, where we stand impacts what we see. So if you look closely at this picture, it's difficult to discern where one person, the child, begins or ends and where the adult in it begins or ends. If we change our perspective, we'll change what we see. And so I heard a coach say earlier this week that we as coaches can be the bottleneck to a player's learning when our learning stops. And so I've always felt that, that, that if we stop learning, we are, can't be at our best to serve the athletes that are in front of us. What we know today about how the brain, the body, and the emotions, uh, how those things come to life is far greater than what we knew to be true, say 10, 15, and definitely 20 years ago. And so we must continue to evolve so we can be the best version of ourselves, so we can impact the daily training environment and impact the experience and learning ultimately of the athletes in our charge. So this comes to the most fundamental question. What's the best way to design practice? I want to start with a framework that was passed on to me from Mike McKay. He's the high performance manager 
uh, at Canada Basketball Women's National Team Program. And this is it. Your who combined with your why lead to your what and your how. Who is in front of you? Whether you're working with young athletes at the grassroots level, whether you're working at the other end of the performance spectrum in high performance at the highest, who is in front of you both collectively as a team and the individual? What are their specific needs? And why? Why are they there? Why are they performing? Why are they undergoing this challenge? We've got to get very clear on those two things. And when we when we do get clear on those things, then that feeds into the what and how. And in my experience, I think one of the, the common mistakes that have been made is a lot of times we start with the what and the how. And I want to flip that on its head and, and come back to our who and our why. This uh, formula, if you will, is I think an anchoring point when we talk about what does it mean to be athlete centered? And for me, that means putting the athlete's best interest first. And in order to do that, we need to start with the who. Who's the person in front of us? And how do I serve their needs? So in today's presentation, I also want to have some fun and juxtapose two different contexts. One, that's going to be grassroots sports focused on kids largely 6 to 14, 6 to 15. And then the opposite end of the spectrum will be uh, the WNBA, my other context or my main thing. Um, and I want to show you how we use uh, these coaching techniques, these, these principles in both of the different environments. And so hopefully you can you can see how we, 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 we bring these things to life in different con contexts, but also you can see the similarity, the, the commonality in the themes. So there are two underpinning truths about learning. The first of which is the learner has to be interested. Think of the old saying, you can't put anything in a closed fist. And I think tied to this is the idea that we have to connect. This goes back to the who. The onus is not solely on the individual, the learner or participant to be receptive. One of, I think, our biggest challenges as coaches is to be able to connect, to foster a relationship with an athlete, to allow them to open up, to feel safe, vulnerable, so they can explore this, this next phase that you as a coach are trying to take them into. And then the second truth about learning is there needs to be something they can learn. Okay, so if we think about an eight-piece puzzle, once that eight-piece puzzle stops presenting a challenge, the learner loses interest. The opposite side of that is if you were to present somebody with a hundred-piece puzzle, if the required skills and knowledge and capabilities aren't present to deal with the complexity of that 100 piece puzzle, then the learner will also lose interest after failed, repeatedly failed attempts. And so our challenge is to apply the Goldilocks principle. Most of you know the story of Goldilocks, too hot, too cold, just right. And so although we're going to be sharing uh, evidence-based and some science-based approaches to, to driving learning, there is an art to it. There's a craftsmanship to it. And so this, for me, it uh, harkens to this Goldilocks principle. Said differently, desirable difficulty. And the researchers agree that practice needs to present a level of desirable difficulty. I love this phrase. And when we can find that balance between effort and ease, the challenge isn't too great and the challenge isn't too small, that they're always being pushed and we're continually uh, ratcheting up intensity or leveling down, turning it down, dialing it down a little bit. We find that sweet spot then we've done our job. We've gotten good at the art of coaching. 
So let's talk about some techniques for designing your curriculum or designing a practice plan or your learning environment. I'm going to start off by freeing this from the youngest age group, and then I'll take you on the journey into an older aged athlete. Okay. So when we talk about creating a, a, a learning environment, where one falls on the instructional continuum must align with your who and your why. I'm always going to draw you back to our formula. Whether you're going to use a random approach to your drill design or a block approach, whether what you're doing is linked to something that's been covered previously or their previous background knowledge, or if it's unlinked, it's brand new. And so if you think of these dials, I like to use this visual. I don't use all these techniques in all my sessions, but I am continually trying to reference back. When am I going to start from a static position? When do I want to do something dynamically and why? When does something require opposition, whether it be a guided defender or a live defender? And when do I want to do it unopposed? When does something individual or multiplayer? And so this has become a, a good reference tool for me to evaluate and assess uh, the process that I'm using. And then I can use that to track how that moves the needle measuring the progress. So some general principles, strong starts. So it's, I've, I've flipped the terminology for me at least on its head. We refer to them as learn ups, which to me are more important than warm ups. Especially if you're working in youth sport, kids come pre warmed up. I'm thinking U12, U13. So there's no need to do structured warm-ups. You can do activations as taking somebody from control to chaos. But I think in my experience from observing some people who are very good at, at, at leveraging the opportunity, they don't see them as warm-ups where they're passive, but they're also using that time to, to optimize the training experience. And I'm going to give you some examples of that later. But you're thinking of priming the group with fun openers. You're not just priming the body, but you're priming the mind and you're priming the emotions, right? We call it priming for positive. And then using routines to enhance rigor. In youth sport, there should be lots of races, chases, tagging, battles, games, competitions. And we say all day or all week long. Another technique, don't design drills. Instead, create small, addictive games. So avoid the drill and kill approach, which is something that I, a young version of me felt, fell prey to that as well. I had just stacks and stacks and binders upon binders of just randomly disconnected drills. Instead now, my approach, especially when we're talking U17, is to go with games that bring out that juicy, intrinsic sense of engagement, fun, and playfulness, and competitiveness. Okay, so how do we gamify their learning? And there's so many different ways we can do that this creatively, and I'm going to share some examples with you. Co-opetitions should rule the day. We still see in youth sport a lot of elimination games. And my challenge to everybody is to avoid elimination games. When we talk about optimizing learning, what happens is we as coaches can, can eliminate the rigor, we can eliminate the opportunity for learning by using elimination games. Because typically what happens is the least experienced or, or the novice, if we think about the, the performance spectrum going from novice to, to expert, the novices in, in elimination games, the ones who need more repetitions the most, they get knocked out first. And so they, you lose valuable time to make progress, All right? So instead of eliminating them, you could say, okay, if um, let's say, you know, the goal is to make a certain amount of shots or to make a shot before somebody else in basketball, uh, instead of being eliminated, if you don't make that shot first, you get to perform a skill could be sport related, it could not be sport related. Definitely fun, not punitive. And then they're back in and then they can, they can work their way up. 
all right? Minimize team selection, at least in front of players, and contests where the outcome is determined only by individual score. There are a lot of creative ways, a lot of creative techniques you can use to avoid elimination. You can have multiple ways to win, all right? You can be the winner of this game if you're the last player standing and if you also get the most amount of okay and so there's different creative ways you can do it but think up collaborative activities thinking of you want urgency that's why you have races and chases right so you don't have to talk about intensity if you include a race and chase it's already baked in that in there kids are wired to want to compete and to push themselves so i call them urgent struggle filled challenges that the players must conquer Look at the word conquer. So we talk about language. I'm starting to, to, to bleed in and, and seed my presentation with the type of language that we use. This is when, when we refer to gamifying the learning. We're using the language that kids are drawn to. Okay. And ending on a positive note, every session should end like a good meal with a small, sweet reward. And if we do this with intention, pulling back on a favorite game, a cheer, some type of ritual or routine, a win your way out, fun ways to do it. Either way, at the end of the session, that sets the tone, the feeling for the next session, priming for positive. So let's go deeper. So ACX Basketball is a passion project of mine that I started here in the Cayman Islands. So Cayman Islands is home for me. And it's focused on kids aged six to 15. Most of these kids have very little exposure to the game. The, the game itself, most of these kids come from Commonwealth countries. And although this, they're drawn to the sport, it's not a habit to watch the sport. So they don't get to see it. They don't get to touch it. They don't get to play with it a lot. So how do we bring these practice design concepts to life in this environment? We have a play-based curriculum. The premise is lots of touches, lots of chances, and lots of shooting. And as I, and I, as I pointed out before, in every session, you'll see races, chases, battles, games, and coopetitions, and everything's gamified. I think to Carol Dweck, who talked about one of her core principles is going hard first. And we utilize this in our ACX basketball program and said differently, what I like to say is, we're gonna teach them how to play first and then we'll teach them how to play well. So we're gonna go whole and then we'll come and add detail and texture to the picture, the parts and come back to the whole. But in our ACX environment, we don't withhold the game from kids. In fact, right away, we're playing. Because at, in that environment, in this context, when we think about the who, they want to play. Kids don't say, hey, when, when can I practice, coach? No, they want to play. So the worst thing that we could hear in that environment is, are we going to play? No, it doesn't happen. All right? And so... For them, it's just play. We're playing a series of games. But to us, it's serious, brain building, skill growing, fun. So let's talk about our play space. One ball per child. This is an important one, right? So we go back to our who. When we're looking at, at, at kids, I would, I would argue, and there, I know there's research on this, but uh, definitely U9, but I still find it still shows up U12. The orientation is internal. They want the ball. They want their own ball. They don't want to share the ball. Those of you working in youth sport, when somebody gives up the ball, the first thing they're saying is, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open. I want it back, All right? They want to have a ball in their hand. So leveraging this, this, this human orientation we ensure that as much as possible, a kid has a ball in their hand. We use intermixed ages and abilities, and we throw out any adult-centric frameworks. No refs, 
no rules, no fouls. I know the fouls one is, is sport specific and people have questions around it. I can share more, but this is not how kids see the game. We distort the game, we change the spaces, we create an adventure. So in this picture here, you're seeing something we call the gauntlet, All right? It is uh, at its core from a teaching outcome perspective, we're working on ball handling, we're working on vision. You see a, a coach here and she's got a, a foam, uh, foam stick. It's actually a flotation device from a pool that I cut up. And this becomes a book gauntlet, almost like there's a sword coming up and coming down, right? So we don't talk about getting your eyes up. It's baked into the game, right? And so joy and wonder and adventure, this is the language through which kids see the game. And so we wanna pull these concepts and use them to enrich the environment. We're still getting the technical, tactical, and skill development we want, but that is coach speak to them. It's adventure. It's fun. Our environment includes scaled equipment. We're fortunate to have height adjustable baskets. We use smaller and lighter basketballs. Why? To make the game accessible. At this age, the thing that kids want most to see the ball go through the hoop. And so as many repetitions and as many instances that we can give them where they see the ball that goes to the hoop, the better, okay? And so you'll see in this image, mixed dimensions. Sometimes we play the game going sideways. So not, not on a regulation court. Sometimes one basket will be perpendicular to another basket. In a session I did earlier this week, I, I was able to adjust the height of all six baskets in the gym. And so each basket was at a different height. The adult in us would say, oh, that's not basketball. That's not how it works. The kid, when kids, when they walk in the gym, they're just like, oh, this is awesome, right? Their brain is on fire. And now it presents a different challenge. That learning is taking place below the surface because now they have to focus their attention and orient on, okay, how do I make this shot on a lower hoop versus a taller hoop? But we don't need to talk about attention. It's baked into the game. For those of you who don't have height adjustable hoops, no problem. If you can't bring the basket or the goal down, we can bring the floor up. And here's an example of that. I've used some gymnastic mats on the ground and you'll see they're at different heights and kids love them. They hop on, they're close to the rim. Again, they're seeing the ball go through the hoop. Okay, and there's still there, and there's a physical um, uh, tie into that in terms of teaching them how to drop and pop off the ground. But to them, it's just play. And they love walking into a space and looking around and, and wondering what's today's space going to look like. So let me take you through our practice plan so you can see an idea again, um, tying back into to, um, practice design. We start with our guiding principles. And for us, they're simple. Bring your best self, do the right thing, treat others the way they want to be treated. And so in different ways, we're always coming back to this as our guiding principles. These are our overriding principles with the kids. And you can see within what we've done here is we've got our modified play spaces. So you'll see every session comes in and when our coaches walk in, they'll look and see, okay, what's the orientation of the baskets? And we set it up differently. And I map that out for them. I talked earlier about our endings, finishing on a high note, but your beginnings are just as important. So we use routines to develop rigor to create connection and to facilitate communication. This is how we begin to build our culture. Pictured is we circle up and I love this analogy. A circle is without beginning, without end and every piece in the puzzle counts, right? And so this is how we create the sense of inclusion. It seems simple, but there's depth to it. And this is a part of the culture and the routines that we have. It's in our circles that we will do debriefs. We'll handle what we call breakdown conversations when somebody's behaviors doesn't, don't align with our commitments, i.e. our guiding principles. 
and then we'll have a breakdown conversation in there. We use our whistles with intention. So for us in this environment, one whistle just means freeze. This will be a quick stoppage or quick intervention, 30 seconds or less. And then we allow the athletes to go back and play. Three whistles for us means just sprint on in to wherever we are. Maybe we're changing our orientation. Other routines might be, we have something we call sideline, baseline, three-point line. And so with one word, athletes can get themselves organized so we can present the next game progression, and then we can keep moving. And so we practice those routines, right? So we can get rigor out of our sessions without being ruthless. Get on the line. No, we don't need to do any of that. We just become disciplined about our routines. So we can be demanding, but not demeaning. Activators, every session starts with some type of fun activator. Again, we're thinking about the brain, the body, and the emotion. These are key for us. Our activators, we also call learn-ups. I referenced that earlier in the session. And then our curriculum is play-based. Daniel Coyle, um, if those, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Daniel Coyle, Daniel Coyle, his work is fantastic. He's written a couple books, one of uh, which is uh, Talent Code, a great read. And he makes a reference to uh, what he calls, um, uh, what's, what's the framing, sorry, um, soft versus hard skills. So uh, a hard skill is something that needs to be done the exact same way every time. A soft skill, is something that comes to life based on the constraints that are in the environment. And so basketball being a barrier free sport, right? We've got bodies, we've got defenders, we've got teammates, time, space, all these things change. In my opinion, the only quote unquote hard skill I've been able to come up with is shooting. And even then I could argue that shooting other than a foul shot is in many ways a soft skill. It changes based on a defender and space uh, and, and all of these, these context-specific elements that take place in a bear or freed sport. And so other than shooting, you'll see in our play-based activities, our shooting is, is technical and it's in that category of hard skills. So we separate that out and we treat that as such. But everything else from ball handling to passing, we don't do those things on air, we do them with with guides, with implements, ideally with, I heard somebody call it bones, not cones, okay? And it's play-based. I just wanna contrast our, so, so in red, what we'd seen before were our U9 plans, and here is what it looks like for our U15. Our framework, which ties into our philosophy, which I think is anchored around our who and our why, is to play to learn. You'll see on that practice plan, three on three sideways. Remember I talked about changing our orientation. This is hands down one of the favorite activities that the kids get to play and they're always asking to play more. And then I'll draw your attention to violations versus rules. Coach speak, we might call those a constraints-based approach. We use violations rather than rules. We do introduce rules, right? And we trickle them in over time. But more important is how do we reinforce learning either through reward or through consequence, right? We keep it light, we keep it fun. But for instance, you'll see these are uh, examples of different violations that we call using our language, right? Which is unique to our environment. And these re reinforce the habits of thought or the habits of play that we want to see come to life. Arrival activities, our beginnings and our endings, and the end on a high note. The themes are the same, although the age group and our who and our why are different. I couldn't go by without touching on this one. Culture. Mistakes are expected, respected, inspected, and corrected. And we share this framing and we talk about this and our beginnings and our endings and we celebrate and we spotlight mistakes as a necessary part of learning. And to me, this is tied to our who and our why. 
It's tied to optimizing our learning environment. A scared athlete can't be a learning athlete. If they're afraid, if they're fearful of making mistakes, then they're not progressing at the speed and the rate that they can be if they felt that their vulnerability is accepted. And so as coaches, we have to model it. We, we invite feedback. We have a back and forth with our athletes and we celebrate mistakes. Sometimes if you were to walk in a gym, you'll see us, you know, dancing and, and up and loud and boisterous. We'll stop the whole gym to celebrate those things as necessary steps to learning. And one of the things, again, feeding into this culture of creating safety and vulnerability is we talk to the kids about not comparing their work in progress to somebody else's finished product. Right? So often it's, it's the iceberg illusion. Somebody else looks and says, oh man, they've got it. I can't. And we say, hey, you can't yet, but you haven't made enough errors to get there. All right, and so let's go make some mistakes. And literally that's how we say it, okay? Our primary KPI, key performance area is as many as possible, as long as possible, and as fun as possible. That's it, U15. Now, are, is there technical and tactical elements in there? As good as possible? Absolutely. But our prime directive is to never be a child's last coach. Pretty simple, pretty clear. And it's an overarching principle that fits that age and stage, that who and that why. So let's contrast this to the complete opposite end of the spectrum, high performance. The WNBA is the highest level of women's basketball in the world. And let's, let me share some examples of how we build or bring in these similar concepts in a different context. Their who and why is different. The ultimate KPI is to win a championship. This is more outcome or product focused than the other end of the spectrum. And yet we still focus on our process. We have our guiding principles, gold standard, finding joy in the journey, All right? And so even within, um, we, we have this grind culture that's uh, popping up throughout sport. And so I'm team anti-grind and we talk about it. You have to be able to find the joy in the journey. We talk to our athletes about protecting their joy. It's difficult to do, but it can be done with intention. Embracing expectations. We talk about the brain, the body and emotions. This is the brain. What's the mindset? What's the thinking? How do you approach the media scrutiny? Uh, looking at contracts and salary and maybe trying to, to, to get a new deal, free agency. We talk about embracing all of those things and we keep those conversations at the forefront. Find an edge. This is one of our guiding principles as a staff. Uh, we spend the entirety of our off season thinking, well, how do we get better in our player development, in our athletic training, in our stats, in our tactical stuff? Every touch point along the way continuously is working on getting 1% better during our off season. And resilience as players, as a team, as a staff. And our last guiding principle is the we, where we are of the team. Training sprints. So this is a concept that I've pulled from the tech world, Silicon Valley. And for us in DC with the Mystics, a training sprint is a deliberate time boxed, focused development period intent on taking a growth area from idea to observable action, ideally in games. And so this is my definition of learning. And uh, Nick Winkleman in his book, uh, his latest book on cueing, has a beautiful definition, what he calls it, uh, performance. It's when we teach something in practice and the athlete is able to perform it. And yet the skill breaks down, there isn't retention and transfer to the game. So that what we have is, a short-term expression of the thing that's being taught. But learning requires that thing to be retained and transferred to the game. And so our ultimate benchmark for how we're doing is, 
is that thing we're working on, whether it's uh, mental, physical, technical, social, emotional, is it showing up in the game? Training sprints. This is where we test out solutions in short, manageable, purpose-driven chunks of time. A chain, training sprint could be one week, two week, four week in length. And really what we're saying is, okay, this is the thing that's, that we want to improve. And we wanna have check-ins to see how we're progressing. We want to track the process and at the same time, measure the progress. But we don't wanna to wait to the end of the season. We don't wanna to wait to the halfway point. We wanna continuously be asking ourselves, how are we doing? Are we headed in the direction that we want to be headed in? Are we getting a return on our, our training investment? And so sprints are about deep practice. They're about depth over breadth. To give you a visual of its practical application, right, the bigger loop is our season. Right? We've got this big picture goal. And in a professional context, you've got a lot of games that are coming fast and furious, all right? So we have to have the, the immediacy of the moment uh, in that context is important. We've got to win games. And then we've got these, these building moments where we have team practice. So within that bigger loop, we've got our training sprints that are taking place concurrently. And then the thing that we're asking ourselves continuously is, are our corrections and our interventions, do those align with the focus areas that have been outlined in an athlete's individual development plan, i.e. their training sprint. And that's how we assess uh, something, I, I call it feedback fidelity. Retention and transfer. One of the things that we're trying to get better at and going deeper on is, um, so this graph is an example of a typical forgetting curve, right? When something's first introduced, there's a drop off over time. And so how well are we going back to revisit that thing? In Doug Lamov's book, A Coach's, a Coach's Guide to Teaching, he does a great job of unpacking this. And one of the things he highlights is the best time to come back and revisit something is when it is first being forgotten. And so going into this season, my plan is to track how well we're doing for coming back and cycling back and revisiting context. How are we spacing learning? How are we reintroducing concepts so that we get better retention and transfer and less leakage? In our ACX sessions, you saw how we, we uh, do our learn-ups. Now, different context, different culture, different terms. So we talk about activations and priming. And so even in our, even in, in that pre-practice time where we're moving from control to chaos, we're not just saying, hey, we want to prime physically, but we want to prime, right? The body, the brain, and the emotions. And we're going to interleave skill work in it. In a professional context, you don't have a lot of time. And so we want to maximize our time. So as much as possible, we have a ball. We have players connected, right? Different context. So instead of more co-opetitions, co right? They, these, these women are in compete mode. So we do more time and score, special situations. We're continually assessing ratio. How much time are we doing things on air versus having somebody contest it using bodies? One of the things I challenge coaches to is when they talk about uh, decision making, and they say, I say, well, how are you, how are you, what's your process for decision making? And they map out their plan. What I notice is that they make the mistake of isolating something. And for me, a definition of a decision is a choice between two or more options. So by that definition, to me, you can't be working on decision making if you isolated something. In basketball, you hear coaches a lot talk about reads. I'm just going to work on this read. And they get a number of repetitions and repetition of that quote unquote read. That's a blocked practice. And then they go to the next read and they do that as a block and then the next. Well, that's not decision making because the athlete hasn't had to make a choice between two or more options. Now, and then is that choice made in context relative 
to bodies. Okay, so, so these are things that we're all continually thinking about. So is our work scripted or is it guided? Complementary pairings and targeted rotations are other concepts that we use in this context. Instead of going to the default approach, uh, guards and bigs, now we're, we're going deeper and we're thinking more about usage. Who plays together? So, and, and how can we have those two working together so they can develop a connection, a rhythm, a feel? We moved away from having a, a democratic rotation. So for instance, the image on the right, let's say this athlete in blue, if her training sprint is on defense and the two uh, athletes in red, they're a complementary pair, they spend a lot of time in this action together. Well, this would be a, a targeted rotation and a complementary pairing. Instead of having the blue player cycle through and get her repetitions on offense, no, we would wanna keep the ratio different. So it's more tied to the sprint. She might stay on defense the entirety of the time because that aligns with her sprint. She needs to prove defensively, whereas these two need to improve offensively, so they'll stay on offense. So it's, we've moved away from this 50-50 uh, equality-based and have it aligned or more equity-based. What serves their sprint? What serves their greatest need to drive the needle in improvement? So just some ideas. Film study, learning edits, and we do some player-led scouts. Uh, I can come back to this if anybody has questions on it um, and, and give more, more to that. But I, I do want to continue to make progress and talk about queuing, giving some specific examples of what we do around queuing. Your queue quality and quantity have a direct effect on athlete learning and performance. Cues have the power to direct attention to the right thing at the right time. And I think it's something we can and need to be more intentional about. A simple example, I shouldn't say an example, it's not simple. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's an example of, of, of what we do, which has um, notes of gamifying, but it's a tool that anybody, if, if you're in basketball, can be used. And I think there's a sport specific version for those who aren't in basketball. They're called BRADS, back rim and down, okay? So it's an acronym for us. Stated differently, whenever the ball enters the basket, enters the goal, it interacts with the rim in a certain way, right? So this is physics, this is all, all math. A made shot that enters the rim to the right is gonna ricochet back to the left. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, right? And the same thing, if the ball enters to the left, it comes to the right. The, the optimal shot is what we, which is a brad, back rim and downs. The ball hits the back of the rim and trickles straight back. And so we use this in our practice. If you came into a missed succession, all the athletes know brads. We want to develop consistency over being brads shooters, making clean shots. And so to gamify it, uh, since these are the highest level of, of athletes, these women are, are very skilled. All right, we won't count a shot that's not a Brad shot. And so it might've gone in, but if it doesn't trickle straight back, we won't count it. And so we're ratcheting up the intensity of thinking and in focus and, in, and attention without necessarily ratcheting up workload and physical intensity using this tool called Brad's. Couple other examples how we gamify our experience. We work on being in a row shooters. So not only do we want our athletes to be Brad's shooters to make shots clean and consistently clean, but now we want in a rows. And our players are all anchored around it. Here's, here's one, one athlete who was with us two years ago, she, making 14 in a row. And she does it and we call it red line shooters. So the, the WNBA three-point line is slightly closer than the NBA three-point line. We're fortunate we share a facility with the uh, Washington Wizards, our NBA counterpart, and so their line is down. And so we gamify it and we say, hey, you're ready to be a red line shooter. We want all our shooters to be red line shooters. So it's gamified, but the tactical uh, value is tremendous, right? 
the, the further away our players can shoot from the basket, the more they distort the defense, right? Spacing before advantage, and that advantage creates opportunities to exploit. But we've gamified it. And you, hopefully you can see the difference between athlete speak, red line shooters, right? Short, concise, and coaching speak, tactical, gamifying, distorting, et cetera. Right? On feedback, feedback should be fast, focused, and actionable. This is a stretch for me. I'm working into this. But remember, just like our cueing, and cues are a type of feedback, feedback drives attention. And I do believe now that the primary function of a coach is to direct an athlete's attention to the right thing at the right time. Here's an example where coaching staffs and coaching teams can get themselves in trouble. We have five individuals, and this doesn't even include parents and the chatter that comes in from the sideline. Is the feedback from these five people aligned and is it complementary? Stu Singer, who's our mental performance coach, would say, attention is a skill to build. And if it's a skill to build, we need to have an intention as coaches to where we place our attention so that in turn informs how we conduct our interventions. And our intervention will drive a player's attention. Mouthful, I know, but this is, uh, in my experience from observing some really good coaching environments, this is where the greats get it right. I referenced training fidelity earlier. And I love this quote from Todd Bean. He's a football soccer coach. Um, he says, if you want players to solve challenges against opponents in a match, they must learn to solve challenges against opponents in training. And so is the environment that we've created does it match up to the outcome, the learning outcome that we want to have take place? Similarly, does our feedback support optimizing learning? And is it aligned? And is it consistent? Something to think about. And so as we wrap up, I'll leave you with this last thought. As coaches, I believe our function is to design the process, set the intention, guide the emotion, both ours and theirs, cue the action, and then direct attention. Rinse, repeat. We're continuously going through this process, both on a macro and a micro level. Process, intention, emotion, action, attention. Let's take a time out. That is the end of our session. I wanted to leave some time uh, for questions. And so I'll revert back. Tasha, you're still there. I would love to know mm -hmm. if uh, we, we've got questions out there. I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, we do. Thank you. We've had a lot of great chatter in this session. Uh, people really liking what you're saying. Uh, but as Fu said, we do have some time for some questions. So you can use the chat session box on the right hand of your screen. Uh, so first up, we have one from Mike that came in earlier. He's asking, should you be using your voice rather than a whistle in practice? And for reference, he was saying in games, the referees have whistles and coaches have their voices. Yes. <laughs> I think it's all of the above um, and would, it, this is a really interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to it at all. Uh, it just really depends on your environment and your context. You know, for instance, if you're in a double gym or a triple gym, um, you know, an effective tool is just the whistle. Um, but I've also seen examples of other coaches who choose not to use a whistle at all with the um so so for instance with our the u15 group that i get to work with i do use a whistle with our professional athletes i never use a whistle i don't have one with me um 
But even with the youth, the youth athletes, I'm just using the whistle to, to get a quick attention grab, quick whistle, boop, right? They turn, that's the end of my whistle. And then I'm using my voice as the tool. And uh, I think this is, um, I'm reading into the question, but to then get very intentional about when we go up in volume, when we go down in volume to, to, heighten, um, to heighten attention is important. Uh, where, where we cut off words, the rhythm and the pacing of our, of our tone uh, are all things that we can think about and should be thinking about. Um, I did have an example um, that I, I didn't end up sharing today, but there, um, there is uh, a number of activities. Um, one of the things that we do in our ACX sessions um, is we crank up music loud and it's fun. It's gamified. The kids love it. And in that instance, in, in those instances, I should say, when I'm doing that activity, there is no whistle. And then I'm strictly going to my voice. And I do have an activity where I say, find my voice. And so we have fun with it. But what I'm trying to, to develop is this habit of having, just like a, as a parent of their child, to having an acute awareness of my voice. So if we're in that loud gym and there's things going on, I want the players to be able to differentiate my voice from um, any other thing. But even in that environment, just to pull on that question a little bit, I've seen uh, uh, coaches who um, just got their own whistle and they just blow it like in game to get their to get their uh, players' attention. That's in effect like a whistle. I've got a number of different sounds I use as well. Yeah, like parent, kids know if they hear that they're going to turn and look because I need something that sounds different than the rhythm and the pace of all the other ambient noise, so they know I I need them because sometimes it's difficult. And so whether you choose to go with a whistle or not, I encourage coaches to develop a tool, just like they would in their play call, to develop a tool that says to their athletes, I need your attention. And something that would transmit across a gym in, in a loud and crowded space. Really awesome. good question. Thank you. Uh, another question here from Mateo. Any recommendations on books to design practices with more play in mind? The um, the best book uh, that I've come across, I, and if, if coaches haven't uh, read it yet, um, that touches on a lot of what we've touched on here is a book called The Coach's Guide to Teaching. I referenced it earlier. You'll have to tell me if this is in the frame or not. Yes, it is. <laughs> Perfect. It's by Doug Lamoff. And um, many will know Doug Lamov. He wrote um, Teach Like a Champion and Teach Like a Champion 2.0. He's written another very good one called Perfect Practice. Um, full disclosure, I am uh, a contributing author. I've got a couple segments in here. I don't get any money or proceeds from it. It's just really good stuff. And um, Doug is the first person that I've seen who's taken um, sound pedagogical principles and now have applied them to specifically coaching. So this is a very good read. It talks about um, using play, um, play-based practices, constraints-based practices, or games approach as well. There are some good ideas in there. Um, the other one I, I had referenced, which doesn't directly relate to Mateo's question, but is a good read, I think, is Nick Winkleman's book. You can see I've got it <laughs> marked up, uh, The Language of Coaching which indirectly, Mateo, doesn't tie to your question, but in, sorry, directly doesn't tie in, but indirectly does, because even as you venture into play-based, we need to, I think, with intention, think about our language. Because even a, a, a play-based to me doesn't mean we just roll out the ball and the kids play. There still need to be some learning outcomes. It still needs to be linked to some, some, some learnings, whether they're individual, technical, uh, tactical, um, you're, you're, we're using uh, gameplay and constraint space to drive learning, which over time will start to appear like the real game, so to speak, the adult five on five version of the game. Um, but our job is, as coaches to me is to facilitate learning. So as you think about designing your practice and you think about using a games based, constraints based uh, approach, you still need to, to think about your learning outcomes, and then to create alignment about whomever is going to be um, at that practice. 
who your coach is. Because what you don't want to have is, is you create a game and you as a head coach are thinking, okay, here's the learning outcome for this. I want to get them, you know, moving the ball and attacking space. And yet somebody else looks at the game and they go, oh, we need to work on our shooting, our scoring, our finishing. And you have different interventions taking place in the same activity. That's where you have infidelity, if I can use the play on words. And so um, that's my encouragement when you're, you're thinking about creating a play-based uh, environment. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have time for, I think, another question or two here. But uh, the next one from Bernadette is, have you moved away from delayed feedback or processing later? And I think this is in reference to giving quick and concise feedback to athletes. I, I have not. Uh, Bernadette loved the question because it, it, um, it's, it's on my personal, remember we talk about finding an edge, it's on my personal list of where I need to get better, uh, asking better questions. Um, a good friend of mine uh, and mentor uh, uses Bloom's taxonomy. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with it, most teachers are it's used a lot in the educational uh, realm, and I, it has application in sport. But Bloom's taxonomy um, it references uh, how we deepen learning. All right, uh, a real basic level of learning is just just general knowledge. Right, maybe I know the terms, and then you get deeper. You're talking about comparison, analysis, ranking. And then eventually, as you get into the, the deepest level of learning is creative variation. OK, and so even to your 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 question on delayed feedback and the use of questioning um, or I'm, what I'm reading into the use of questions is to think about the types of questions that we're using. And then the next step for me is the types of question I'm using based on where a participant falls on that spectrum from knowledge, uh, sorry, from novice to expert. So a novice, I might might just ask a knowledge-based question. A novice, I might ask a knowledge-based question. What do we call it when we trap the ball in the corner, right? Knowledge-based, just tell me the name, right? And then I might turn to another, Alex, okay? And so why? What, what, what does that create for us? And when we trap it, what does it give up? I'm asking for ranking and comparison and a deeper understanding. Sometimes my feedback is uh, direct, and there is a time for feedback to be direct. Other times it needs to be reflective. In a game, you, it's not the time to use a lot of reflective questioning, right? You need to do direct feedback, but your post game or your next day analysis can ask for more reflective or delayed feedback. Sometimes live in a practice, I might just say, hey, what did you see? How are you being defended? What else should you be perceiving? So I'm just directing attention with my question, but I'm not giving a, a direct one. And then later on, we might come back and debrief either coach led or athlete led. Perfect. Thank you so much, Safu. This has been a great session, great feedback in the chat. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending. The next session of OCC 21, What Are You Thinking? Creating a Reflective Practice to the Think Aloud Method begins in 30 minutes at 2 p.m. Be sure to also check out our networking tab on the left side of your screen and you can start meeting new friends all across Canada where you can send private messages, start a video call, or even start your own group discussion all conference long. So again, thank you, Safu, and we will see you all at the next session. My pleasure, thank you.